So now let's talk about symbolic notation and some logical tools we can use to evaluate the validity of some logical statements. So the conditional statement, if P then Q. So I don't know if you noticed in the last video, but there's a lot of writing when you're writing these long statements. So we generalize those statements by saying if, and instead of writing the whole hypothesis out, we use the letter P. And then it, likewise for the conclusion, for the conclusion, instead of writing out the whole conclusion, we write Q. So not only does it shorten it, but um, it also allows us to talk about things in general. We're not doing something specific to a certain case. So sometimes the specifics get in the way and we can't think about um, all of the possibilities. So P and Q allows us to do that. So if I'm writing this symbolically, we write P arrow Q. And remember that the way we say that is if P, then Q. Or another way to say that is P implies Q. So the converse is symbolized as this. Remember, converse is when we switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. So that would look like, instead of if P, then Q, that would look like if Q, then P, or Q implies P. Now the inverse, remember, is when we took the original one and negated it. So I'm going to take that original P arrow Q and negate each one. And the way we show that symbolically is with a little tilde or a squiggle. So if not P, then not Q. Or another way we can say that is not P implies not Q. The, the contrapositive, remember that is when we switch them and negate them. So I'm going to take that converse and negate it. So not Q implies not P. That's how we would write the contrapositive symbolically. And then the biconditional we mentioned before, that is when it can go both ways, so we use a double arrow. And the way that is uh, read is P if and only if Q. So that's what the two arrows mean. So those are uh, symbolically what we do. If you need to go back and review what those statements mean, then please do that in the previous video. So then now let's talk about deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning uses facts, definitions, and accepted properties in a logical order to write a logical argument. All right, so deductive reasoning, you might have, um, I always think of Sherlock Holmes. He's like, I'm going to use deductive reasoning. So he always uses facts, um, certain principles and rules that always apply um, in order to make um, a conclusion. So. For example, the school lunch calendar states that pizza is to be served on Mondays. That is a fact, okay? So, since today is Monday, we would conclude there will be pizza served for lunch. So, this is totally based on facts and definitions and what's been established, okay? So, that's deductive reasoning. Now, how does that differ from inductive reasoning? Inductive reasoning is when we use previous examples and patterns and observations to form a conjecture. So for example, um, if we noticed for the past three Mondays, the cafeteria has served pizza for lunch. So it's not a rule. They didn't specify it as a rule or a fact, but we're like, we're just making this observation. Oh, I've been noticing that they serve pizza on Mondays and today's Monday. So I'm guessing that they're going to be serving pizza for lunch. We do this all the time, especially when we develop patterns. If I said, here's my numbers, can you guess what the next three numbers would be? Well, we look at the first four examples and we, we try to figure out the pattern or how they're related. So it looks like they're all odds, so we would, con we con would say that the next one would be the next consecutive odd. So that would be like 9, 11, 13. All right, now, that's just, sometimes it's true, but it may not always be true. So you can see that deductive reasoning typically is stronger than inductive reasoning. We have, we, a lot of times we have to use inductive reasoning because there aren't established rules. And, you know, a lot of times our patterns are, are true. All right, but just keep that in mind that deductive reasoning is, is, is slightly more, um, 
use, uh, not useful, I would say it's a stronger argument than inductive reasoning. Because could I have said, I could change, this pattern might be changing further on down the road. Or if we take the, the, um, the lunch scenario, yeah, they might have been serving um, pizza for the last three Mondays, but on this Monday they didn't because they ran out of it. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Okay, so going back to deductive reasoning, we said that's a little bit stronger, so let's look at some laws that we can use. So when it said we can use some principles, this is one of those principles we could use. So this is called the law of detachment. So if you have a true conditional statement, so notice that I have to have a true conditional statement, and I have to know that the hypothesis is actually happening. All right, then we can conclude then our conclusion must happen. Okay, so for example, if I say, if Mrs. McCahan is my teacher, then I go to ENH. We've already established that that's a true conditional statement, right? Well, then I say, okay, Joe has Mrs. McCahan for a teacher. So what should your conclusion be? What, do we, what else do we know about Joe? Well, we know then that from that, using the law of detachment, then we know that Joe goes to Parkway North. So that's all the law of detachment says. It's kind of obvious. It might seem obvious to you, but um, it, it's important um, to, to recognize when you can and cannot use that. Um, so for example, you would not, if I said instead, I had this tr true conditional statement, but then if I said Joe goes to PNH. Would you be able to conclude that Mrs. McKeon is his teacher? No, right? Because that's not what the law of detachment says. And a lot of people erroneously um, make that kind of conclusion and they're not using proper logic. Okay, so for example, here's some other true statements. If Jana works this weekend, then she can buy an iPod. And then we know she did work this weekend, so what can we conclude? She can buy an iPod. Okay, here's another true conditional statement. If TJ's car breaks down, then he will be late for his job interview. So TJ was late for his job interview. Does that mean we can conclude that his car breaks down? No, we can't make any um, conclusion. There are lots of things that could have caused that, right? He could, he could have hit traffic. Um, he, I don't know, he might have taken the long way around. And, and so there's lots of different um, conclusions that we could make and we don't know which one it is. So there's no definite conclusion we can make um, logically based on that. There's also another type of deductive reasoning, which is called the law of syllogism. This one involves two different statements. So if P implies Q and Q implies R are both true conditional statements. So I have two true conditional statements. What I want you to notice about those conditional statements, though, is that the conclusion of the first statement is also the hypothesis of the second. So if that is true, then what we conclude is that we have another true conditional statement. And that statement would be the hypothesis of that first one and the conclusion of that second one. So here's how that works. Casey goes to a music store. Given that the following true statements, can you conclude that Casey buys a CD? So here are true, here are two conditional statements. If Casey goes to a music store, so this is the P part, then she shops for a CD. 
Okay, and it doesn't have then, but we, we know that they mean then. So she shops for a CD. Okay, so that's the Q. If Casey shops for a CD, do you see how that Q part is repeated? Okay, so that is now the new hypothesis of that second conditional statement. Then Casey will buy a CD. So because I have two true conditional statements, because they told us they were true, and that Q part is repeated, so the, the conclusion is the hypothesis of the second one, then what we can conclude is if Casey goes to a music store, then Casey will buy a CD. So that's our new conditional statement that we know has to be true. Now, it is asking us then, can we conclude that Casey buys a CD? Now we have to go back to the law of detachment. So look at what they're giving us. They said, um, Casey goes to a music store. That is what the hypothesis, our new hypothesis says, right? So if we know this is true, then the conclusion has to be true. So will Casey buy a CD? Yeah, because um, of all of those statements leading up to that conclusion. All right, so we will do a lot more examples in class and do some practice with that because I know it's kind of new and um, sometimes things make sense and then sometimes things are confusing. So please, please, please take note of which questions you have as you're watching these videos and we will address them in class.